The Empire spent a lot of money on the Death Star. Over a trillion credits, if we're being specific. And hey, why not? It could have potentially not only ended the Rebel Alliance, but through sheer fear solidified Imperial control on the galaxy for centuries to come. With this steep price and of course the battle station's importance, one would assume that the station would be protected at all times. I mean, you don't want to take a risk with something so valuable. In both canon and legends, the Death Star was protected during its construction by an entire fleet of Star Destroyers, with roving TIE fighters continually checking for rebel spies and maintaining an active perimeter around the station. Yet, we get to the Battle of Yavin, and not only does the Death Star not have any sort of escort fleet, but TIE fighters aren't even launched in response to the rebel threat. And we all know how that ended. So why did the Emperor let his new baby die? Sure, maybe a Star Destroyer escort wouldn't have protected the station from the rebel assault, but it couldn't have hurt, right? And this is even more true given the fact that the Empire knew the Alliance had a hold of the station's plans, and could have found a vulnerability, as explained by General Tag. Until this battle station is fully operational, we are vulnerable. The rebel Alliance is too well equipped. They're more dangerous than you realize. If the rebels have obtained a complete technical readout of this station, it is possible, however unlikely, that they might find a weakness and exploit it. I mean, tracking the rebels is important enough that Darth Vader himself is dispatched to do so. One would think that protecting the station is at least as important. Going back to the Clone Wars, we see something very similar with the Malevolence, an incredibly powerful separatist superweapon sent to attack Republic targets across the galaxy without so much as a single frigate accompanying it. And again, we also know how that turned out. I'm starting to see a bit of a pattern here. Anyway, back on topic. With the Death Star completed, we know not only that no fleets were sent to protect it, but in canon at least, some Star Destroyers like the Devastator, as we see in Lost Stars, were actively sent on other missions. Again, why? The new canon reference book, On the Front Lines, has a good analysis of the Battle of Yavin, which I think answers this question in a way that will satisfy both Legends and canon fans. If the Imperial loss could be traced to a single cause, it would be overconfidence, Grand Moff Tarkin had assumed that his Death Star did not require a naval escort. He launched no TIE fighters in the battle station's defense, and Vader had launched only a single squadron. And that's all it is. The Imperial leader, who he'd seen be extraordinarily cocky throughout the entire movie, continued to be overconfident. There is a danger. Should I have your ship standing by? Evacuate? In our moment of triumph? I think you overestimate their chances. Tarkin had Titanic Syndrome. He thought his state-of-the-art, galaxy-changing weapon was unsinkable, and the Empire, along with he himself, paid the price. However, if we're really being honest with ourselves, can we blame him? The book proceeds that quote with the following. By any honest accounting, the Rebel Alliance's chances were infinitesimal. Yet, those odds were decidedly in their favor. Rebel tacticians had projected that small starfighters would have greater rates of survival against the Death Star defenses than heavy capital ships. However, even with this sound analysis, their win was incredibly lucky. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. Or at least, the Force was with them. Tarkin most likely really liked the idea of the Death Star eliminating the Rebel threat and doing so without any sort of reinforcement. And there's no better way to get your new toy destroyed than by trying to show it off. Something similar happened with the Endurance, the first of the New Republic's Endurance-class fleet carriers. While participating in the Battle of Arinda, Admiral Aretta Bell only wanted to launch the ship's E-Wings after the Resistance had been whittled down a little bit so that the ship and her fighters would look great. However, once you know it, the Endurance is destroyed, and with it, went down a whole hangar of unlaunched fighters. In another similarity, after the Battle of Arinda, the New Republic changed their strategy so 
though, that carriers launched their fighters immediately upon entering battle. The Empire, on the other hand, changed by no longer underestimating the Rebel Alliance. They took with them overwhelming firepower to every engagement. I mean, look at Death Squadron and the attack on Hoth. But we also have to ask, practically, would a support fleet have actually helped? And I think the obvious answer is, it depends. Knowing the Empire, they most likely would have thrown a couple of Star Destroyers along with the Death Star and called it a day. I'll come back to that, but imagining they did just add Star Destroyers, would they have helped, really? Nah. The Death Star was already created to be a capital ship killer. Not only did it have an incredibly impressive super laser, which in Legends we see destroy the rebel ship the Fortressa, but its surface was also dotted with thousands of turbo laser towers. There's no capital ship that can stand up to this station. So how could a Star Destroyer, primarily another capital ship fighter, have added that the Death Star didn't already have? Not much. And this comes back to the main problem. Arrogance. We know the Empire did not consider single snub fighters to be a threat to the station. Well, the Empire doesn't consider a small one-man fighter to be any threat. If they did, they would have thrown in some escort ships, some frigates, some corvettes, something. I mean, that's understandable from a point, I guess. They didn't know about the weak point in the station structure, but they did know the Alliance had plans and had been combing them over. And here's the real answer. The Death Star already had everything it needed to repel the rebel threat. Sure, a Star Destroyer fleet could have, I guess, launched TIE fighters, but guess what? The Death Star already had thousands on board. At the Battle of Yavin, the Empire had all the assets it needed, but none of the leadership. On that note, I appreciate how the new canon recognizes this, and Palpatine actually promotes General Tag, as he was one of the only Imperials to actually fully recognize the Alliance threat. Anyway, that's all the lore I have for you guys. But before we go, let's do our question of the day. Today's question comes from Sugar Psycho, who asks, How was the team in Rogue One able to jump to light speed from inside of Jeddah's atmosphere when escaping from the Death Star? And the answer to that, I think, is simply that Canon has been playing a little fast and loose with the use of hyperspace. We've got that instance, the bit with the Falcon landing on Starkiller Base, and the hyperspace ram from The Last Jedi. Whether that bothers you or not, I think, is up to you. Personally, I've always been the kind of person who prefers the actual film to come before the lore, so it can always be explained away in some sort of secondary document. Whether an explanation exists already, I don't know. If you have a question, make sure to leave it below with the hashtag AskEck, and maybe I'll get to yours next time. Until then, this has been Eckhart's Ladder. May the Force be with you.